Okay, g'day all. Welcome to another CUDA tube. Uh, so today we're going to look in a bit more detail at shared memory and we're going to have a look at bank complex and exactly what that means. Uh, we're also going to look a bit at uh, warps because I think it's really important to consider warps when you're talking about bank complex. And uh, shared memory is almost always faster than global memory as we've spoken about in the past, uh, but there are times when it can slow down fairly dramatically. So that's what we're going through in this tube. Uh, first of all, we should talk about warps. I don't think I did a toot on warps, so we might as well do it now. Uh, the threads in a thread block are broken into groups of 32 threads called a warp, and each thread in a warp will have a, con a, a consecutive thread IDX, dot .x that should be, and the 32 threads of a warp are executed in SIMD style by the execution units in the streaming multiprocessors. So they all execute together whenever they can in SIMD style until something like a branch happens, like if you've got an if statement or something like that, uh, where some threads take one path and other threads take another path. Uh, that type of thing will lead to the threads of a warp being executed in uh, serial. Yeah, whichever threads take one path will be executed first, and then after that, uh, the threads that take the other path. So that's kind of why um, branching is really expensive, or can be really expensive in CUDA. It's because the warps have to be split up and s executed in serial. Uh, Alright, but more on to what we're talking about today. We're talking about shared memory, and the threads of a warp really ac access shared memory together. So all 32 threads might make some request from shared memory, and they could all request different uh, addresses in shared memory, just depending on whatever the access pattern is. And uh, they they might all request very fast access patterns, or the threads of a warp might request really slow access patterns and cause what's called a bank conflict, and um, they mightn't get their data for a very long time. So what we're really talking about here today is uh, these bank conflicts. Uh, but I should also say that warps are never created across blocks. Yeah, the 32 threads of a warp, you'll never have sort of 16 threads belonging to one block and 16 threads belonging to another. That's just not what happens. Anyway, we're talking about shared memory, so let's let's just uh, let's just move on. Uh, there's 64k of shared memory slash L1 per SM, and uh, that's broken into four byte sections called words. So the basic unit of arithmetic for any architecture is usually called the word, and uh, for CUDA it's four byte words. So a four byte region in memory could hold a 32 bit int, it could hold a float, it could hold four bytes if you like, uh, two shorts or half a double. It doesn't really matter what it's holding, uh, but they're broken into four byte regions. So here I've drawn these four byte regions for a few of the banks. Uh, we will talk about banks in a second, uh, but you can see it doesn't really matter which order you draw them around in. But usually it's a uh, little endian, so the first byte of a word will be the smallest, um, the least significant byte of the word. I don't even, don't even know why I brought that up, but uh, there's there's 32 banks in uh, in a in a CUDA GPU or NVIDIA GPU, and each bank. Oh, this is shared memory we're talking about. There's 32 banks in shared memory, so each successive word that's these four byte regions, each successive word of shared memory belongs to another bank, and this is where things get interesting, uh, and things get a little bit a little bit complicated. So word zero belongs to bank zero. Word one belongs to bank one. Uh, word 2, funnily enough, belongs to bank 2. I'm sure you can see the pattern here. Uh, all the way up to word 32. And uh, word 32 of shared memory belongs to bank 0 again. So there's 32 banks, and each consecutive word belongs to another bank. Uh, so by the time we get to word 32, we're back to bank 1 again. Uh, and shared memory always reads entire words. So even if your threads ask for a single byte, uh, the shared memory is actually going to read the entire word and just give you the byte from that word that, you, that the thread is interested in. But um, yeah, that might be something to consider as well. Anyway, bank 0 has all of the words uh, that are divisible by 32 on... Uh, that's that's all of the words with indices that are divisible by 32, I should say. Yeah, so it's, it's, not, it's not byte addresses we're talking about here, it's kind of um, word addresses. Anyway, bank 1 has all of the words which leave a remainder of 1 when divided by 32, and bank 2's words all leave a remainder of 2 when you divide by 32. So if you want to figure out which bank any particular word in shared memory belongs to, you can just divide by 32. Uh, do be careful, because you're not actually sure from inside a block 
you know, if you've got a shared memory array with, say, 1,024 items, you're not actually sure which bank that uh, very first item of the array belongs to. Um, but it doesn't usually matter, so... Yeah, it should be all good. Um, okay, so these are the indices. Uh, on pre-Fermi cards, you've only got 16 banks. See, I should mention that. If anybody's using a pre-Fermi card, you've got to kind of consider things to... Uh, half warps? Yeah, 16 threads of half a warp. Anyway, we're not we're not really talking about pre-Fermi here, but what we are talking about is bank conflicts. So the addresses that a particular warp, that's the 32 threads, the addresses that they request from memory can form any permutation of 32 banks whatsoever. So we've got everything from every thread of the 32 requesting from bank 0 all the way to every thread requesting from bank 31, and we've got everything in between. You know, you've got maybe each thread is requesting from a different bank, or, or every second thread might be requesting from, you know, even-numbered banks, and every third thread might request from bank 30. It's, it's completely up, up to the um, programmer and the algorithm. But what's important is that uh, these, these bank conflicts, so whenever a different word is requested from the same bank, you get what's called a bank conflict. Uh, if all threads of a warp request exactly the same value from a bank, so maybe if every single thread reads from bank 30, but the first word from bank 30, then you get what's called a broadcast. So if all threads of a warp read the same value, what's going to happen is that shared memory is going to be read once, and the value is going to be broadcast to the threads. So you don't get any bank conflicts there. It's very, very fast. Uh, likewise, something else that's very, very fast is this operation called the multicast operation. And this is only for compute capability 2 and up, but however many threads read a particular word from a particular bank, uh, the read from shared memory will only occur once, and the value will be divvied out to whichever threads need it. Uh, so you might have, say, five threads reading from bank 2, value 0. Uh, you might have you know, another five threads reading from bank 30, so long as it's the same word that all of the threads read, uh, it's all good. You get this multicast. Uh, but the moment that one or more, or two or more, I should say, the moment that two or more threads read different values from the same bank is a bank conflict. Uh, the moment. Yeah, that's exactly what I just said. So that's really what you've got to be careful of. Uh, okay, so we might just illustrate a few request patterns here. Uh, one of the most natural ways to reference shared memory is to have each thread of your th uh, block read something based on their thread IDX. So maybe thread IDX dot X might be what you're reading there. And uh, I want you to suppose that this is, an, this is an array just up here called A double R, and these values are all word sized. So they're four bytes. It doesn't doesn't really matter what they are, but they're four bytes. Uh, yeah. So this is bank zero, word zero, just up here, and beside that. To the uh, right is bank 1 word 0, and then bank 2 word 0, etc., all the way up to bank 31 word 0, over here on the right. And below is the uh, second words of the bank. So this uh, second from the top on the left-hand side here would be bank 0 word 1. Okay, just to make sure that you understand what I've tried to draw here. It's pretty, pretty, it's pretty excellent. All right. Anyway, the very first example we've got is uh, a constant value for all of the threads in a warp. If every single thread in a warp reads exactly the same value, you get a broadcast, which is what I've highlighted here. So right here we might have something like a double r uh, thread idx times zero. Uh, I have actually left out the you know dot x there. It should be thread idx dot x times zero. But the point is that thread idx dot x times zero is going to give you the same value every time. It's going to give you zero. So every thread in those warps is actually going to be accessing exactly the same value. You're going to get a broadcast, which is absolutely beautiful. Uh, the next example, I put a constant value in those brackets. So once again, every thread of the warp is going to access exactly the same value. Exactly the same bank, but exactly the same value as well. So that's also going to be a broadcast uh, from bank 12. Uh, the next one is also a broadcast. This is a little bit different, but this is actually using the block IDX. Once again, I forgot to put a dot .x there, but that should read something like a double r block IDX dot x times 3. And every thread in a warp is going to have exactly the same block IDX. Yeah, that's just the way that warps work. So every thread in a particular warp is going to calculate exactly the same value for this, block IDX dot x times 3. 
Uh, so whatever it is, they're going to get a broadcast. Good, good. Okay, another really common request pattern is just to use the thread's ID and request consecutive uh, banks. So that's also going to be really fast, exactly the same speed as a broadcast. The broadcast is no quicker. Or I should say, this is no slower. Or I should say, it, it's all the same. Stop saying stuff about it. All right, ARR thread idx.x. That's going to access one word from each bank. Uh, all of the threads are going to read from a different bank, and it's going to be really quick. Good stuff. Uh, what you want to avoid, and here's the first uh, bank conflict example. So I've colored them in red here, but they're not actually that bad. Uh, anyway, what you want to avoid sometimes is patterns like this. So ARR thread idx.x times 2 is going to give you a two-way bank conflict. And you might get a pattern like this if you're working with, say, doubles, since a double takes up two of these words. So if each thread is accessing uh, a consecutive double from an array of doubles, then you're going to get this two-way bank conflict. Uh, you might also get this two-way bank conflict if you're working with structures of two floats. Uh, yep, or any other byte data, 8-byte data structures. Yeah, it'll be a little bit slower. So the actual read from shared memory into the registers before you perform any operations, the actual read will take twice as long. Or four clock ticks. Anyway, it's not often too bad. But what you can do is uh, add another float, or just another four bytes to your structure and pad it out. And that way you get this access pattern. So this access pattern you might get working with... Um, Three. Three word structures. So something that's 12 bytes in length. Uh, maybe something like a 3D point. You know, you'll often store 3D points with X, Y, and Z coordinates, uh, where X, Y, and Z are all floats. So that's going to give you this access pattern. If each thread of a warp accesses uh, a consecutive item in the array. Something like this. A double R. Thread ID X dot X times three. Um, there's no bank conflicts at all which is pretty interesting, really. Uh, you might actually find, though, that this is no faster than working with doubles. Yeah, just depending on the architecture of your card, like, I, I actually found that, despite the theory, um, working with this data structure is actually slower than working with uh, doubles, but, I don't know, test a few things out. That's the only real way to know. Anyway, this is another example. This is a really bad access pattern. This is a four-way bank conflict. So what I've got here would be uh, you might come across this if you're accessing structures of 12 words long, which will give you a yeah, four-way bank conflict, or something like thread ID X dot X times 12. Um, every fourth bank is being asked for four different values, as you can see up here. Uh, but there's three banks in between that aren't doing anything, so it's, it's, it's a bit of a waste, really. Yeah, you might get this sort of a pattern if you've got uh, 48 bytes long structures. And what you might want to think about doing, or try, is uh, just pad your structure with an extra word so that your thread access pattern goes from being thread idx.x times 12 uh, to thread idx.x times 13. And you can see from this, the, the uh, extra padding actually makes the access pattern go from a four-way bank conflict to zero bank conflicts. Every bank is being asked for a value, and you'll get that at the same speed as a broadcast. I hope that makes sense. We will have a look at a bit of that in the code next. So if that didn't make too much sense, uh, maybe a more practical example will help. Uh, oh, yes. Look, despite what I've just said, I've gone to great pains to explain bank conflicts and draw little diagrams. But honestly, uh, a lot of the time, the latency is completely hidden, and it's not the problem. You know, the shared memory read and write speed is very, very fast, even when there's a couple of bank conflicts. So test it out. Test it out in your code and see if uh, adding some padding or changing the access patterns helps your code. But you might also want to just use the uh, profiler to see if your code is, say, shared memory limited, or maybe it'll be uh, arithmetic limited, or reads from global memory or whatever. Uh, yeah, it's something to keep in mind, what we're talking about here, but it won't always help, obviously. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, there's no interblock conflicts. Yeah, it doesn't matter, you know, if, 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 if one block reads from bank zero and another block reads another value from bank zero at the same time, there's no conflict there, it just doesn't matter. Uh, we're talking about the warp level here. Yeah, it doesn't matter about interblock conflicts. And what we're going to code at the end is a uh, clock. 
Yeah, we're going to use the clock function to time a bunch of reads from shared memory. And this is really where you get the uh, actual performance indications. There's no good going through theory all the time. What you really want to do is just time it and see how quick your code is. Change a few access patterns and see what happens. Uh, OK, in conclusion, there's 32 threads in a warp, and if each of them access a different bank or exactly the same value from a bank, uh, you get really good performance. A broadcast, a multicast, yeah, that sort of thing. But only if, uh, only if there's not more than one value being asked from any one bank per warp. Uh, the performance hit for a boot few for a few bank conflicts is pretty minimal compared to going to the L2 or compared to global memory, but you might want to just fiddle around with access patterns or padding. And uh, let's have a bit of a look at the clock function. What I'm going to do is uh, pause it because I guarantee you I will mess this up. All right. All right, uh, I'm back again. So the um, screen recorder is playing up, and I noticed that it flickered a lot in the last uh, two, two looking at those slides. But um, yeah, there's not there's not really much I can do about that. Let's just um, let's just ignore it, shall we? We'll pretend that it didn't flicker, or that when it flickered, it was really really cool. Can we do that? <laughs> Yeah, let's do. Alrighty, I've got this little uh, CUDA testing program open just here, and we're going to explore the effect of a few different access patterns and time them. Uh, if I just scroll down a bit, we'll see what we're doing. Uh, I'm just warp. Uh, I'm just. <laughs> I'm just launching a single warp of 32 threads, so it's not the most practical example. And often you'll find that the performance decreases from bank conflicts are nowhere near as dramatic as what we're going to be uh, showing just here. Uh, I want to mention also this CUDA device reset method, which I don't think I've spoken about, but at the end of your program, you should uh, do CUDA device reset if you want to use a profiler. So the device kind of writes all of its uh, performance indicators uh, only after it's executed this CUDA device reset method. So put that at the end of your program if you want to use the profiler. Anyway, my kernel, uh, the clock function also, that's what we want to talk about. So the clock method or the clock device function just returns the number of clock ticks. Uh, so what we're going to be doing is taking the clock ticks at the start, then we're going to be doing something in here with global memory, not global memory, sorry, shared memory. And uh, then we're going to take the clock ticks at the end and see how many clock cycles went past. Alrighty, so the first access pattern that we might want to time is... Um, I'm just going to increment them as well, just to, yeah, whatever. Uh, zero, plus plus. Okay, so this is the time for a broadcast. If uh, every thread in the warp accesses exactly the same shared memory value and just increments it. I mean, there's race conditions just abound here, but I'm, I'm ignoring that at the moment. But we'll get the broadcast, which is really, really fast. Yeah, there you go, two clock cycles. So I actually run the test ten times just to make sure that we're getting sort of a standard value, but two clock cycles is all that it takes there to do that, which is pretty good, really. Uh, another access pattern that we might like to try is thread idx.x. So this is going to ask for a single value from each of the banks. And other than the um, slightly more complicated addressing pattern here, uh, it'll give us the same speed. So it'll give us maybe four, because there's a little little overhead for using... Yeah, for using a slightly more complicated addressing pattern other than just, you know, shared zero. Uh, but that's a really good speed as well. So four clock cycles, no worries. That's the speed that happens when there's no bank conflicts at all. Uh, but if we move up to times two, this will give us a two-way bank conflict. So every thread is accessing an even... Oh, sorry. Yeah, every thread is accessing an even-numbered bank, and the odd-numbered banks aren't doing anything. Two-way bank conflict. Let's have a look. All right, there you go. So six. Yeah, so we've gone from two, which was the original broadcast with a really simple addressing pattern, uh, to six clock cycles. This is not too bad, really. Six is okay. You could probably live with six, especially since there's going to be more than one warp happening at once. What we might go up to is maybe eight. Yeah, so eight's going to give us like a four-way bank conflict or something. I just, um, I don't know. It's going to give us bank conflicts anyway. 
There you go, 21 clock cycles. So this is becoming quite a dramatic difference. Uh, 21 clock cycles is substantially different from, say, 2 or 4. Yeah, we're getting a lot of slowdown here because of bank conflicts. I tell you, the worst of all is this one, 32. So each thread is accessing a different value from bank 0. 32-way bank conflict. This is going to be cool. Let's see what happens. Oh, look at that, 79 clock cycles. So, you know, it's it's just, it's bad. That's slow. Yeah, 79 is really, really slow. Compared to the four clock cycles we were getting just a minute ago, this is terrible. Uh, all right, but it mightn't all be that bad. What you what you might want to do is uh, struct, play around with a few structures. So we might say maybe I've got a structure called that, hehehu. Yeah, but we might have maybe X, Y, Z, W. Yeah, something like that. So a 4D point, basically, is what I've got here. And uh, if I change from, from, from my shared array of floats to a, a shared array of whatever these things are, and then we have a bit of a look at what happens. Uh, I might change this back to thread IDX as well. Okay, so here I've got every thread of the warp accessing uh, a thread IDX index of this new uh, array of structures that I've made, but the important thing to note is that each of these structure elements here is um, yeah four floats wide, so this should give us exactly the same performance as uh, the float array before when we accessed thread IDX dot X times four. Uh, we'll have bank conflicts, basically. Is what I'm saying. Hello, something's gone wrong. <laughs> yeah, get out of here. Come on. Don't use so much shared memory. I'm going to actually make this 512 and see if we can run it. Uh, that error there was just saying that I'm using too much shared memory. Alrighty, so there you go. 11 clock cycles. 11 clock cycles. It's not too bad. It's not too bad. But there's definitely bank conflicts going on in there because we're nowhere near the 4 or 2 uh, clock cycles that we want. Uh, if, if we just add some padding though, padding F, if we just add some padding, uh, we'll get rid of all of the bank conflicts there. So, yeah, try adding some extra padding to your structure and changing it from having some even number of words to some odd number. You know, we've gone from four words here to five words. And hey presto, we should be back at our four clock cycles again. Bingo. Yeah, there you go. So it's that easy, really. Yeah, it's that easy. Anyway, that's just a bit of a look at a few access patterns. Uh, it just it just keeps going, really. Oh, I should say I didn't I didn't say in the um, slides, but uh, the pattern repeats. So something like that. Yeah, if you're working with structures that are 64 words long. Uh, you'll get exactly the same as if they were 32, or say 128 words long. Uh, they all give you the same kind of uh, latency. You'll always get um, a 32-way bank conflict if you work with that sort of a structure until you add that extra word of padding. Uh, that changes it from being a dramatically bad uh, performance to a really good performance, and uh, that's really what you're after. Anyway, play around with it because uh, like I said, you're probably going to have more than just a single warp of threads running at a time, and it's you know it's likely that your limiter isn't actually your reads and writes to shared memory. Yeah, the limiter from a kernel may well be something else. Anyway, uh, have a good day, I suppose, and uh, see you later. Let's see if I can stop this stupid thing. Oh, I can. <laughs>